All right. So we are we are recording now. Um, again, this is Stories of Possibility. Um, my name is Gretchen Sneathan, and I am from the Temple University Collaborative on Community Inclusion. And I will talk a little bit about what that is so you can get a sense of, of who I am and where I come from. Um, first of all, this is the, these are the things that we're going to talk about today. Uh, what I really hope that you come away from this with is understanding um, what a community participation story is and the benefits of developing and sharing those stories, both benefits to yourself um, in sharing it, but also the benefits to those individuals that you might share the stories with. We will go through some, some key concepts that support you in your own story development. And then we, in the group uh, breakout session, uh, you'll start to work on putting together, maybe not a full outline, um, but some key components that will certainly get your, your gears turning on how to develop your own community participation story. I am uh, pretty laid back with presentations and uh, um, I encourage you if you have questions throughout, please drop them into chat. I, I, I find it much easier to address them in the moment um, than to, to wait and hopefully remember, have everyone remember exactly where I was. Um, so yes, please, please interrupt um, and add those things to chat. And I look forward to engaging with you all today. I'm trying to go forward. Oh, this is our, I did go forward. I'm sorry. Um, this is our outline. This is a little bit of a breakdown of the, the things that we will be doing. Um, um, you know, hopefully we'll stick to the timeline and we will move through. So who are we? Um, we are the Temple University Collaborative. We are affiliated, obviously, with Temple University. Uh, we're funded through the National Institutes on Disability Independent Living and Rehabilitation Research, um, which is a it's a federal funding mechanism. And the the cool thing about Nidler and the work that we're able to do with them is that we. Um, we get to focus on promoting community living and participation. And, and I'll talk a little bit about what I mean by that, but these are the really the key things that we do. We really try to target and understand the obstacles that prevent people who experience mental health conditions from being full and engaged members of their communities. We try to identify those supports that individuals and communities need to enhance um, opportunities for community participation. And, and to that end, we look at those personal things that people can develop in their own, um, I call it toolbox of resources, but we also look at communities and um, look for ways to help create more welcoming and engaging environments where people are welcomed and included as the diverse individuals that they are. Uh, and then we also try to expand the range of opportunities uh, for individuals with mental illnesses to participate in their communities as active and equal members. Um, to that end, we, we do a lot of research to do this, but we also offer training and technical assistance, training sort of like this today. Um, and I will also say that, you know, if there's anything that you heard today or you hear today and you're like, that is, um, that's something that I would like to learn more about, or I'd like to find a way to integrate this into my own practice or, or introduce this more specifically to my organization or agency, please don't hesitate to reach out. Um, I'm always happy to talk uh, through these types of things with folks and, and really figure out uh, ways to implement it um, in your own space. Uh, because as we know, everything looks a little bit different from place to place and reflecting on the uh, the, the differences and the needs that might be in those environments. Um, so again, this is these are sort of the two key things that we do. We develop, uh, we implement research um, and try to change practice through research, but we also, uh, as I was mentioning, provide training and technical assistance. So what do we mean by community participation? And uh, I like this slide because it has pictures of lots of things going on, but, but communities are a place for 
people. Um, communities are an opportunity to connect with individuals we know and care about. It's an opportunity to meet new people. It's an opportunity to engage with people who have similar views, but also diverse perspectives. Um, it's an opportunity to figure out who we are and develop our identities um, and express those identities to those that are important to us. It's a way for us to um, feel connected to the larger environment. Um, we also know that the, that communities provide access to resources and access to opportunities. And so when we when we talk about community participation, we really think about that full spectrum. It's employment, it's education, it's relationships, it's parenting, it's um, engagement in religious communities, it's spirituality, it's participation in recreation and leisure, it might be volunteering. Um, and it, it may look different based on the individual's desires and needs. Uh, it could be going to a park just to sit and enjoy. It could be joining a basketball league. Um, really, there's variance um, across individuals. And one of the things that we really like to emphasize um, related to community participation is that as much as possible, it should look Community participation should look like the same opportunities for everyone. And so, um, you know, I've I've worked with an organization uh, where they they would bring in external community members to offer similar activities within the within the mental health system. Um, and while that is certainly well meaning and can be a a meaningful experience. It's not the same. It's not the same as supporting people to engage in that mainstream community and make those connections uh, within the mainstream community. So that's really what what I'm talking about is those opportunities to engage and express your identity within the broader community. And why is it important? Go forward. Okay. <laughs> These are some of the core uh, beliefs that, that we have related to community participation. Um, it's a medical necessity, uh, meaning that by engaging in the community, you have opportunity to improve your cognition. There's opportunities to increase social interaction and develop um, meaningful and important relationships. Um, there's opportunities for increased physical activity um, just by getting out and moving. Um, there's opportunities to improve mood um, and experience some positive uh, interactions, relationships, experiences that can be uplifting. We also know that community participation is a human right. Um, people have the right to live, work, and play in their communities, just like everyone else. And um, and in doing this uh, and, and understanding that it's a human right, it should be a key area of support that um, mental health services and mental health providers are really thinking about ways to support um, individuals to engage in that broad community. We also know that community participation reflects self-directed care um, because uh, we're increasing individuals. We're not, we're, I'm sorry, I, I phrased that wrong. The desire to increase participation in meaningful areas is very central and individual to the person. I can't tell you. Um, what you should do in the community. I, I mean, I can, but it's not going to reflect your own values. Um, and, and what one person's community participation looks like may be vastly different than someone else's. And that is, that's beautiful. Um, and it really recognizes the value of diverse participation. I'm going to do this because I forgot that these slide up. So the, the key terms that I want you all to think about today, um, we talk about, we will talk about recovery narratives, um, which uh, you may be familiar with as a peer specialist. These are first person accounts of experiences with um, recovery with and recovery from um, recovery in or recovery from mental health problems, um, including elements of struggle, adversity, and overcoming and survival. Um, recovery narratives can be a very important tool um, in a peer's um, toolbox um, in connecting with individuals, and, and they can be a source of um, understanding connection and even inspiration for others, um, and just a, a collaborative approach that that 
I can do this, we can do this kind of thing. Um, and, and we talk about, or I talk about recovery narratives today because I think it gives us some common language and understanding of, um, of the power of storytelling. We will be shifting a little bit away from that recovery narrative um, and not so much focusing on one's experience as a person with a mental health condition, but really more focusing on um, those activities in the community that make you who you are? Is it your story as um, a new employee? Is it your story story as a parent? Um, is it that first time that you tried um, rock climbing? Is it that first time that you ran a marathon? Is it the first time that you had dinner by yourself and that was kind of intimidating? So there's lots of different ways that we can think about those stories of community participation and how they really reflect our identity. Um, they may, might draw upon our diverse backgrounds and experiences to emphasize those individual challenges and struggles that you might have had, um, but it might also emphasize your own personal strengths and resources that you've drawn upon to, um, to accomplish those stories. Um, a story uh, is, is another term today, and this is an account of incidents or events um, that is often told for entertainment. Um, it's also told for education. It's told um, in a way that um, people can learn and grow. It's a story that it, a story can be a tool that we learn and grow um, and better understand ourselves. So it can be really a self-reflective process as well. Um, my parents have this, this great um, piece of sculpture uh, that they, they bought, um, I want to say it was in New Mexico, and it is, um, it's a Native American grandmother, and it has, uh, it's called the Storyteller, and it's this, this large figure, and it just has, she's reading, um, and it has these grandchildren kind of climbing up her, her skirt, and I just think it's really powerful to think about the stories that intergenerationally we have, um, and even not necessarily within families, but in connecting with each other. Um, stories can be a fantastic tool for, for connecting and learning um, through others' uh, lived experience. And, and stories, I like to think, are the thing that makes us human and really helps us to connect to one another. Finally, the last thing that I that we'll present on at the end is uh, the idea of story slams. Um, and story slams are a live storytelling event where storytellers may volunteer to share typically a five minute story related to whatever that chosen theme is. Um, a story slam is not your life story because that would likely take more than five minutes, um, but it shares a very specific moment in time with the beginning, middle, and end. Uh, and we're I, I talk about story slams because I think that they are a unique way to frame community participation stories uh, because we all have more than one. You're not going to have one, only one community participation story. Um, and they, in, in having these story slams, they give you, they can give some structure and help with thinking about the types of stories uh, that you want to tell. Uh, and they can be a fun way to either um, within your own local community say, okay, let's get together and, and implement a story slam for us. Um, but you can also connect with story slam opportunities that might be happening out in the community. So with that, I am going to dive into a story um, of my own, and then we are going to kind of pick, pick apart the pieces of it. And you get to see Hudson. Um, this is uh, my two-year-old. And my story is called Dining Out. And I will start with day 763 into the pandemic. I drove to daycare to pick up Sawyer and Huddy. This was our normal routine. Get the kids at the door, hang out under the maple tree, walk across the street to see dad doing yard work at the church, then go home and figure out the ever ending question, what's for dinner? We've tried meal boxes, we've ordered pizza, we've made turkey burgers, we've made pasta, we've eaten at the table, we've eaten in the playroom, we've eaten in the front yard, we've eaten in the backyard. Huddy's gone from not existing to eating solid foods. Um, we have not eaten at a restaurant. And today was the day. It was 4.45, early enough that restaurants shouldn't be busy. 
we headed over to Marco Polo and were seated at a window seat. Window seats by the parking lot are optimal as cars and trucks driving by provide opportunity for endless entertainment. We ordered food and asked that the kids' food come out as soon as it was done. Sawyer was entertained with Hot Wheels, but Huddy was restless and hungry. Of course, he's still breastfeeding and likes his after-school happy hour. I take him out to the car to get Sawyer's water bottle and let Huddy have his milks. We stop by the window uh, by our table to play peekaboo with Sawyer inside. Heading back inside, we walk over to our table. Still no food. Sawyer's now standing on the bench, combing the carpeting on the wall. Um, and there are other tables of people dining, more than I had expected. And of course, they're all smiling and trying to interact with my kids. My kids, of course, are pandemic kids who aren't interested in entertaining strangers. Finally, the pizza comes and it is piping hot. My ravenous children look at the pizza like it is manna from heaven, but of course it is untouchable for the next seven minutes, taunting them with promises of cheesy tomato goodness. Finally, the pizza is cool enough to eat. Uh, they devour it in five minutes. The pizza is gone, water, milk, gone. My food, my husband's food, nowhere to be seen. The kids, ready to play, ready to walk around, ready to not be at the restaurant. My husband takes the kids out to his truck to entertain them while I wait to track down the waitress. Our waitress, gone. Anyone who works at the restaurant, gone. Finally, our food comes out and I send it back to be put out in takeout containers and pay the bill at the same time. We get home, we play in the sandbox, race cars, run baths, read books, pick out jammers, pick out clothes for the next day, tuck kids into bed, snuggle them, kiss them goodnight, then fix up, fix lunches, wash masks, pick up toys, then finally turn on the oven, heat up my lasagna and sit down to eat and think so much for restaurant dining. Day 764 is more of the same. Drop kids off at daycare, navigate the toy landmines, strewn across the floor, hop on Zoom. 4.30 rolls around and I head to daycare to pick 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 them up pick up the kids we play under the tree and head to the car as I'm loading them up Sawyer asks can we eat at a restaurant and I come to the realization that all moms come to mom eating dinner at 10 p.m is a success because the kids ate at a restaurant so that is my story dining out um and we're, what we're going to do now is talk a little bit about um the benefits of storytelling. We'll dig into that story um, a little bit later, so sort of keep it in mind. Um, but I want to talk about the benefits of storytelling. And, and this has been um, research-based um, and research that is really focusing on the benefits of for individuals who do experience mental health conditions. And there are personal benefits in telling your story and also interpersonal benefits. And some of these personal benefits include um, improved self-esteem, that increase of self-awareness because you learn about yourself through storytelling. There's also opportunity to uh, develop your identity and express your identity. There's also a sense of achievement. You get to learn um, and see your achievements through a different lens. Uh, and you can also generate hope in telling and developing your own stories. From an interpersonal standpoint, it can um, be a really great opportunity to create and establish connections with other people. You can find commonality. Um, through that, you can learn about people's experiences and, um, and develop an empathy um, for, for the diversity of experiences that people have had. You get to hear different perspectives of how people have handled maybe similar situations. You also have the opportunity to develop friends um, through maybe shared and common experiences. Um, and storytelling is a great way to connect with some of those existing relationships and improve those relationships. There are also listener benefits. Um, these are similar to the, the interconnected um, benefits that you might, um, that were on the last slide. And, and these might include that connectedness, there also might be some validation, especially when you hear people who've had maybe similar experiences. Other people's experiences might be a source of hope for you. It can also be um, lead to some empowerment and thinking about, well, this is how they navigated it and had success. Maybe I can do that as, as well. There's also opportunities to appreciate other people and their, their um, experiences. And then there's this idea of a reference shift. Um, and those that's important because it, it can help us think about 
um, maybe similar situations differently. When we see how people maybe um, problem solved um, and experience, uh, then we may be able to look at it from a different perspective and then think about how we might um, approach a similar situation differently based on the experience and the story of someone else. There's also that common experience, and this is more specific to those recovery stories, to reduce some of that stigma um, and shame that people may feel um, related to having a, a, a mental health condition. Having those shared experiences and talking about them publicly can give people um, a recognition that this isn't something to be ashamed of. This is something that I have a shared experience, and it's just part of who I am. It doesn't have to be the only part of who I am. It's just a component of it. Um, you know, in talking about benefits, it is also important that we touch on um, potential risks of storytelling. There, you know, it's it's with anything, um, it's not all roses and puppy dogs. Roses have thorns and and puppy dogs sometimes pee on your carpet. Um, and so so what are some of those risks that might exist? Um, there are potential harmful impacts on storytellers that, that might uh, relate to the discomfort of, of public disclosure. So typically within recovery stories, there is an expectation that, that one shares um, information about their, their experience specific to having a mental health condition. Um, and, and they may, some people may regret that disclosure depending on how they feel like their story is received. Um, and they may, um, we talked a lot about the, the, the benefits in terms of connection, but if people don't receive your story in a way that you hope, um, there may be a sense of disconnection after participation in a storytelling program. Um, the process, and this is where it's really important to encourage people to tell the stories that they want to tell, um, and, and not force storytelling into a certain structure or uh, certain elements of, of um, personal experience that are required, because that can lead to a potentially painful, overwhelming, or frustrating experience. There also may be some risks to the story recipients or the listeners, um, and these might be feeling inadequate. Um, if other people seem to have these glorious stories, uh, then you yourself may feel like, oh, uh, I don't have anything like that. And so they may be comparing um, the best of everyone else to the worst of yourself, which is sometimes human nature to do. Again, there may be some disconnection if you don't see yourself in any of the stories um, that people are sharing pessimism um, about your your own place and where you are might be something that that comes up. You may feel uh, that you are a burden uh, because you may feel like based on the stories you're hearing, you have more problems, more challenges. And, and so clearly I must be a burden to other people. Um, and there may be some distress or discomfort from hearing uh, potentially very positive stories or even um, very challenging stories that may be difficult for some people to hear. And, you know, I, I, I talk about the risks mainly to make sure that we all understand that um, there, there could be harms uh, that could occur from storytelling. And it's impo and important to really keep an open dialogue um, with yourself. Um, but also with people that you might be working with in uh, when they develop their stories or when you share your story to make sure that that there's open space to have those conversations uh, so that people don't have these risks and experiences in silence. Um, so, yeah, just just something to be aware of there. So why do we need stories? Um, we know that stories are often included as a, as a key component in, in services and in programming. They also um, uh, are an opportunity for, for uh, peer support specialists to connect with the individuals that they are supporting. Um, there's also a need around um, recovery narratives and recognizing that strict recovery narratives in the way that they've often been um, developed and shared 
uh, historically may be somewhat limiting um, and actually may may decrease some of that narrative authenticity uh, because uh, there there's when looking at training around recovery narratives, um, sometimes there is a very they're very structured in a sense of the the components that are that are included in those. And we believe, um, and that's really what this presentation is about today, that people should be supported to develop and share those stories of community participation um, in addition to recovery stories. And so today we're going to dig into what those um, community participation stories are. So the question, how do we support individuals to shift focus from recovery narratives to developing those stories of community participation? And this is a very broad question. How can we support other people? How can we support ourselves um, in developing these stories? So the proposed solution here is to uh, focus on developing stories related to those valued social roles, um, related to welcoming places, and related to natural supports. And we'll go into detail about what those are. Um, we also want to approach storytelling from an artistic perspective um, and include opportunities for sharing stories uh, within ma mainstream storytelling resources. We go. Um, throughout this, we're going to talk about four guiding principles um, for uh, uh, for community participation stories. I apologize. Um, so we developed these uh, four guiding principles of developing stories of community community participation. Um, the the they're based on what we call the fundamentals of community inclusion, uh, which give us some guide, guide, guidance um, and kind of keep us in check in terms of our core values. Uh, but these will reflect uh, throughout these guiding principles of, um, of stories of community participation. <laughs> Excuse me. So the first um, guiding principle is that stories of community participation uphold the values of self-determination and the dignity of risk and never require or force disclosure of any aspect of a person's identity. Um, in sort of a short version, it's the storyteller's choice whether and how to share personal information through storytelling. So the self-determination piece here is that um, people are able to choose the stories that they want to tell. They get to highlight the, the, the strengths that they want to highlight. They get to highlight the challenges th that they've had um, that um, they feel are pivotal uh, in their storytelling journey. And there's also this idea that there is dignity in risk. Um, storytelling always takes on some element of risk. Uh, because you are sharing something personal uh, to, you know, sometimes there's risk in sharing it even with people you know, um, and there's there's risks in sharing it with uh, a room full of strangers. Uh, you all don't know me, um, but you know a little bit about me now because I, I shared, you know, a story about, about my kids and, and some of those challenges that come with that. And, you know, there's a certain level of vulnerability um, when you when you put out your story uh, outside of yourself. And, and there's a certain level of vulnerability in just telling stories um, and developing your own story for yourself as well. But there's, there's, there's dignity in that. Um, taking those risks can be really empowering for the individual. And so recognizing that, yes, this is a risk, um, but helping people to make those choices and recognize that those, that risk is theirs to take. The second principle is that stories of community participation are focused on the person, not the patient. And we use patient here very intentionally um, and represent those diverse stories of living in the community. So again, this is uh, this is a shift from any sort of story that focuses uh, just on the, not just, but that 
is the the experience of a mental health condition is central to the story. That's not what these are. Um, stories of community participation um, really emphasize those diverse roles that people have out in their communities. Um, the storytellers are welcomed as individuals with unique strengths, problems, interests, cultural identities, and are never defined by impairments or differences. Um, that said, your experience of having um, a mental health condition, a disability, coming from a mi minority community, whatever it might be, may shift your perspective and may inform your experience and will shape how your story is told. Um, but it's always up to the storyteller uh, as to how those, those are um, presented and reflected um, and whether or not they are disclosed. Stories of community participation really embrace multiple domains of mainstream life and participation in areas that are important to the storyteller. So in, in, mean, in, in understanding what that means, the storytellers' creativity and experiences are honored by offering a variety of strategies and exercises rather than a predetermined format um, that's focused on one thing. So a, a story that is about um, learning, we'll say broadly, um, could, could touch on a formal education system. It might touch on, you know, learning a a, a family recipe from a grandparent. It might be, you know, the life learning that happens just going through your day-to-day -day life. Maybe you you miss the bus and 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 you learn something from that by by navigating a new environment. Um, so so and it might touch on multiple ways of engaging in your community and it might reflect different um roles that you have. So when I say roles, you know, take a moment to reflect on the your the own role, your the roles that you have within your own identity. You know, I'm a I'm a parent, I'm a wife, I'm a educator, I'm um I'm a, I'm a sibling, um, I'm a daughter. So there's all of these different things that sort of come into who I am uh, that shape the stories that I have. And those different identities and roles may come out um, within a single story. Guiding principle number four is that stories of community participation are intended to be shared with diverse groups of people and in places that are open to everyone, uh, regardless of their experience of a, a mental health diagnosis or history. And so what that means is that um, there may be multiple ways and opportunities for people to share their community participation stories. Um, it might be in a public event kind of thing like a story slam but it can also be you know in a in a less formal environment where you know you share a community participation story um in an interview to sort of explain who you are and talk about your strengths in in a in a different way um we share stories when we get to know people you know think about a, a date that you may have gone on when you were trying to get to know somebody you might use storytelling as a way to one share with someone who you are and share those values, um, but also get to know them in a different way. There we go. So let's, um, let's talk about the different elements that might be relevant within a uh, the stories of, of community participation, or I'm sorry, within dining out. So let's think about the different um, domains of participation that came in. And when we talk about domains, these are things like um, uh, uh, shopping, education, employment, volunteering, parenting. So within uh, dining out, there was um, obviously going to a restaurant. Uh, there was there was the role of being a parent um, within that. Um, there was also the role of um, engagement in, in this is loosely connected, but engagement in education because there was picking up kids from, from a school. So there were multiple environments that people were uh, engaging in. There were natural supports, right? So you think about, so natural supports are those supports within a system that are um, there 
they're naturally occurring. Uh, they can be family members. They can be um, those individuals who um, that we that we connect with that are not through a a, a paid support. So you know anyone within a a health related support role is not necessarily a natural support because they are at the end of the day they're there because they were they were paid for a job and someone came in to access services and supports and so those the so we typically think of natural supports as things that occur in the mainstream community um where people aren't specifically being paid to provide support um it, it's funny, and I, I laugh a little bit because um, when we, we talk about the natural supports within dining out, uh, there's there's obviously um, the support of the 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 main character's husband, so he was there as a supporter, um, and then there's also the natural supports of the the restaurant and people. There's sort of this argument of well, those people are paid to be there because that's their their job. But it is um, an opera. It's in interacting with sort of the supports and resources of the community, just like everyone else. Uh, and then welcoming places. Welcoming places uh, is the idea. <laughs> and I just saw on the table in that picture um, that it says "Do not sit," so that may be an unwelcoming place. Um, but welcoming places are those places where you can come in as yourself um, and you are welcomed um, for the diversity that, that sort of makes up who you are. So in this in this place, um, the the restaurant was pretty welcoming. It had some some environmental features that made it, you know, more active acclimated to accepting a family there was the the window that we were able to sit by which made it more welcoming there was um sort of the flexibility to come and go uh you could walk in you could walk out there was um the the staff was accommodating and bringing out food early um you could also talk about features that maybe were less welcoming within that environment um but highlighting some of those features of the space to think about, about it as a welcoming place can be important um, within the community participation story. And then the, also, the opportunity to express those valued social roles. Um, the main valued social role in, in dining out um, would be that role of a parent. So let's talk a little bit about um, social role valorization. Um, and this is a theory that the basic premise is, is that um, that people who hold valued social roles will experience more good things than if they didn't hold those valued social roles. And the goal of um, social role valor valorization is to facilitate, support the development of those valued roles, um, especially for people who have experienced being devalued by society. So. Um, and, and social role, you can achieve this by developing your social image as perceived by others. So, and what that means is, is through telling stories that emphasize your engagement in these roles, you can actually enhance your perception of, your, of, of that role for yourself, but you also communicate what that role is to other people. Um, so valued social roles might be a parent, a partner, a student, an educator, a family member, a researcher, a volunteer, a friend, a storyteller. And, and there's this is, you know, not an exhaustive list, but these are just some examples of things that that society places some level of value on. Not that they are the the only judge point of it, but that that people often um, have a desire to express that they too um, engage in those social roles and, and have examples of how those social roles are important to them. The next is um, welcoming places. And these are places in the community that can be viewed as providing an opportunity for being, doing, and becoming. Um, we actually had our own research study that, that where we conducted a series of interviews with people um, with lived experience of a mental health condition where they could identify and really describe at least one place in the community, um, a place that was open to everyone, uh, where they felt welcomed as a whole person. 
And the, the people in this project described a number of places where they felt welcomed from churches to parks, to shopping centers, to cafes and libraries. And I think the, the, the term welcoming is important instead of just inclusion, um, because it, welcoming suggests that there's a desire for that person to be in the space and that that person's um, presence in the space makes a difference uh, to the environment as a whole. Um, and, and when we talk about space, so it's funny, this study was actually originally called Welcoming Spaces. Um, and then in digging into some of the environmental literature and actually architectural literature, places um, was a more meaningful term because places uh, was the term that was used when it talk, when people talk about spaces that are made meaningful by people. Um, and in storytelling, we often consider the relationship that you have um, to different places and how those places can help uh, shape your ability to express your identity of those important roles. And then finally, natural supports. Um, these are these again are those people out in the community that are that are important to you. It is. Um, excuse me, it is family, friends, neighbors, um, that person who helped you at the grocery store, it could be pets. Um, these are these are people or or entities uh, that may help you engage in um, in your community and in those important roles to you. It's anyone who's uh, really not paid to spend time with you. So that is um, that kind of gives us some some structure and ideas around what are those key pieces of a community participation story. But let's talk a little bit about what is a story. Um, so we're going to talk about there are three artistic criteria that really help you shape a, a narrative into a story. Um, it has to have these three elements, and these three elements or criteria are that first maybe let's see something happens something happens in the story um what does this mean so you might think about a phone call but that's not something really happening that's just thought that's that's sort of internal um but making the phone call is that action. And the, the domino here is falling over because that is an action of something happening. Um, so it's an event uh, or an action um, that something happens. In storytelling, thoughts and feelings are not actions. Um, a thought and feeling becomes an event when that action is taken. So let's talk about the something that happens in dining out. Um, so we go to a restaurant, that's something that happens. Uh, the kids are impatient. Uh, they're, you know, they're hungry, they're antsy, they're, they're sort of playing with the wall. Um, the food comes, that's an action, that's an event that occurred, uh, but the kids can't eat it, the kids eat. And then there's a decision here that the, the kids, um, take the kids home and, and mom eats later. So these are sort of the different events that occur in the story. So we have something happens and we have an arrow here because it happens uh, in relationship to someone else. So the next piece is uh, thinking about this criteria, who are the important people or the natural supports in dining out? Um, they're uh, obviously the main character is, is the mom or myself. Um, the natural supports are the husband, the restaurant staff and the kids. Sorry, I'm having some clicking issues. Come on, there we go. And criterion three is these two things um, that brings about a change in the protagonist or the storyteller. And so let's talk about that in a little bit more detail related to, um, oops, what happened here? Uh, 
sorry, this got a little funky in, in relationship to, um, the dining out. So, uh, so let's, so, so I'm sorry, let me just, just take a step back. So what relationship brings the change? Um, so we think about the important relationships in the story. Um, who is the most important person in the story? Uh, it doesn't have, and sometimes this is key. It doesn't have to be someone that you know. Um, often it is, but sometimes those sort of key people in the story that you don't, that you've had this sort of one-off interaction with can cause that, that change in the person. Um, but identifying that important relationship can help you to shape and clarify the events in the story. So I say that, you know, because we want to think about how did, um, how did you change? So you want the, the focus of the story uh, to be, this is where there's an opportunity to reflect. So, so in dining out, you think about, um, the real, the realization of, of the mom at the end, um, not so much when she had dinner at, late at night, but more so when the next day, um, Sawyer asks, can we go to a restaurant? And mom says, wait a minute, this is what I wanted. I wanted my kids to feel comfortable. I wanted them to be able to go to a restaurant. And there's that realization that, um, even though it wasn't exactly my desired experience, it was still a successful experience. And, and it is that, that shift in um, sort of an expectation as an apparent, apparent but then uh, the shift to realizing, well, this is actually what I wanted to come out of it. Um, and so those, those helpful phrases in the story might be, I realized, I became, I learned, I decided, I knew. Um, those can help yourself um, better understand where that that important shift is happening, but it can also communicate that to your audience that these are this is a key point. Um, and you also want to understand why the change is important. Um, and some importance can be big and grand. others might be small. Um, but it, it may still be important to the, the storyteller or that person. And so um, the importance within the, the, char the character myself for dining out is that um, I could have just accepted the story as a failure and we'll never go to a restaurant again. Whereas that, that shift in orientation and recognizing that this was a growth opportunity for my kids is, I think, a pivotal realization that all parents go through at some point um, to understanding that uh, there's often a bigger picture and that single events, um, successes or failures, however you want to define it, um, sh help shape that bigger picture. So, um, and this is kind of a, a reminder here before we jump into our, our breakout rooms. Um, the, we want to think about the stories that are available to you as a person. Um, these, these are only, you know, that answer. Uh, these are, these are your daily experiences. Again, they might be big events that happen to you that as you think about, you want to share a story or they could be, you know, small highlights of, of you know, the relatively mundane day to day. You think about dining out. It's not really a grand experience. Um, it's a pretty common thing. Families go to restaurants. They have uh, they have great experiences or, you know, somebody throws spaghetti on the floor. Um, but it, it's it's just sort of an ex it's a snippet or a snapshot of a life event um, shaped into a story and how that story can be that moment where something changes. Um, so you want to be in, in thinking about the stories that people tell, um, encourage people and encourage yourself to really think about those stories that reflect your own, um, community participation experiences and interests. Um, be aware of what stories are being asked for, um, so it, within story slams, often there's kind of this broad theme that can be interpreted in a number of ways, um, but also recognize that any sort of uh, stories shouldn't 
be forcing people to share specific information about one's identity. Um, sharing your identity, it should be as always up to the storyteller and how it informs and, 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 and connects with that story being told. Um, uh, and these can lead to opportunities for community participation because you can explore those barriers to participation, those things that might have gotten in your way. You can also tap into your own strengths and recognize that that you know you drew upon some of those strengths and resources that you had access to in order to participate. So there can be this realization that you have these resources and were able to use them to navigate the experience within your story. And then you can also support the development of stories by focusing on um, those meaningful events or activities that someone engaged in within their community. And by focusing on that, people have the opportunity to learn and grow from their own experiences and, and build their confidence to engage in similar activities in the, in the future. So we're gonna go to breakout rooms. And before we jump into it right away, I am going to pull up the next slide, um, which will give you some, some guidance on what you're going to do. Um, and I will also remind you that uh, the Mary dropped the slides, um, I'm sorry, the worksheet into the chat. Uh, early at the, the beginning of the presentation. And, and Mary, if you don't mind dropping it in just again, just so that it's, it's easily accessible. Um, but what I want you to do within your group is to talk about common roles that you have, um, common places where these roles occur, and discuss how these ideas could come together in, in a common theme. Um, and so what that means is, you know, common roles might be parenting, it might be uh, a learner, it might be an educator. Um, so just kind of do a quick brainstorm of those social roles that, that you have. And then think about where you're able to express those identities. Um, obviously home, it could be a park, it could be restaurants, it could be your place of employment. Um, but some of those, those common places and you know, I would encourage you to think um, about broad categories of places, not like, um, you know, this one park on this one block kind of thing, because those won't become common places. And then when we talk about themes, um, those are things like, um, like uh, learning opportunities or a first job or um, uh, what, what's one that's kind of funny. Um, uh, parenting faux pas or whatever it might be, but things that that sort of tap across those common um, roles that people might have in in thinking about themes that you guys could develop a, a, a some all unique stories, but that all have an opportunity to relate to others. And then the other thing that I'd like you to do in this is to use what what I call the role tree worksheet to think through a potential story that you might develop um, and share some of these things with your group. So if I were to break down um, dining out, the role in here is a parent, the connections are Sawyer and Hudson, the kids, husband and the community members that you see when you're out with your kids. Um, not specific to dining out, but different examples of places where this role could be, the role of being a parent might occur. There's the obviously the home, the park near the house, in the car, the restaurant, um, the waitress and restaurant, that's, I'm not sure why that's there exactly, honestly. Um, these are other members that might be connected to it. And so, so you'll see that restaurant in there is, um, is the place that that I sort of went with. And then the story was, it could have been taking kids out to dinner on the first time since the pandemic started. And that's the story that I ran with. Um, it could have been playing rocks in the park or climbing, um, uh, climbing through the car to get to the barfing kid. So these are just examples of stories that might express that role as being a parent. Obviously I took the, I ran with the, the dinner one. Um, so Mary, I'm gonna ask you to help send people to breakout rooms um, and um, try to have that document on hand. Um, I will ask 
uh, we'll, we'll come back for some common discussion. Um, I will ask that within your group, there's at least someone who's helping to um, guide the conversation. They don't need to be a note taker per se, um, but guide the conversation and, and keep it moving forward. And I will pop in and out um, just to sort of see where we are at. And um, let's give ourselves about 10 minutes uh, before we, we regroup um, so that hopefully this, this gets your brain um, rolling and, and you guys can start on some uh, story ideas. Okay, everybody, I'm gonna, um, I've got four breakout rooms because we have about 27 participants. So I'm gonna send you off now. Mary, I don't see, I can, I know I can broadcast a message to the breakout yeah. rooms. Um, I might have to do it for you. I've got okay. a couple of people I want to put in. Um, I think a couple of people aren't in rooms yet. Let me see here. Let me just check them. Is there a way I can support you, Mary? Sorry. Is there a way that I can support you? Um, can you put, I don't know if you can do this. I think it's probably just me that can put people into rooms. I think they're there. I think they just have yeah. to join. Yeah, like they just haven't clicked it on their end. Okay, just not joined. All right. Okay, yeah. so what do you want to broadcast? Um, well, I, I, I was thinking this slide right here, um, it's, I mean, it's probably not critical because they do have the, the worksheet. But um, when I click on broadcast, it just says broadcast message. Oh, I'm sorry, you guys can't see this. The, the... Did you go to the share screen? Yes. Yeah. And did it give you the option to um, broadcast the... Oh, maybe I have to stop sharing first. Hold on, let me try. I always find it amusing that share screen um jumps to a different spot okay um basic okay i'm not sure oh, why. shared breakout rooms i see it i see it it's a button oh good uh okay so let me oh you can't see it I can, I can. I just, um, I got to get to the point where I'm redoing this correctly. Hold on. Okay. Give me a second. <laughs> okay. Uh, all right. No. Okay. Yeah, they can, they should be able to see it now. Wonderful. And I, I, I close, I hid our closed captioning. So they don't see any conversation that we have because that might be distracting. It's probably a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> I love the story of hearing, you know, I mean, the the story that you've been chatting about, Gretchen, with the kiddos. Yeah, uh, yeah. it was fun. It was fun to write. 
Yeah, I mean, I'm not a mom, but I'm an auntie. I'm a very avid, active auntie. So <laughs> hearing that was like, yep, that makes sense. Yep, yep. <laughs> it, I swear, we we always ask for kids' food to be brought out first because it just helps give the kids something to do. But I swear every, like, I would rather they just like leave it sitting for five minutes. <laughs> Oh, yes. Every time it's like lava. <laughs> <laughs> I know, right? That's a really good idea, though, to ask them to bring the food out for the kids first. Yeah, bring it first, but after five minutes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. After five minutes. I'm going to have to share that with um, my sister. That's a good tip. Uh, okay, I'm, I'm just going to take a quick break, okay? I was just going to ask you to remind me, Gretchen, when yeah. you want me to close all rooms. Okay. It'll usually, I think it gives them 60 seconds with a countdown. Yeah. Yeah. That, that I think is correct. Um, I'm going to grab a drink of water real fast. Okay. And then I'm going to pop into rooms just to check and see how people are doing. And I'm keeping an eye on time, but I don't know exactly what time we started. Well, probably about 11.06 or 05. Okay. Well, I would look at the clock when you um, started the breakout rooms and it was 11.03. Okay. It yeah. was, but it took a little bit of time to get the, um, the slide up. So I don't yeah. know if you want to figure that in. Whatever. I'm also That's looking at overall time. Direction. Yeah. All right. Well, we'll give them maybe five more minutes because I we do have a little bit of stuff afterwards. Okay. Uh, to go Whatever through. you decide, I'll um. So in four more minutes, I'll put close all rooms, and it'll give them one more minute to wrap up. Yeah. Okay. Your um, presentation has made me think about stories. <laughs> Great. That is that is part of the, the point, to start thinking about your own stories. Well, and I'm thinking in relationship to peer support. Mm -hmm. So it could be stories of, that, of illustrating how a, um, the peer supporter actually accomplished a goal that they're trying to encourage mm -hmm. their peer to accomplish. Yeah. I sent out. Um, I see that. Nice. To the rooms. I always, I'm always hesitant to just pop in because sometimes it is very disruptive to the flow of things. Right. So I, I just said, if you have questions, to come back in here and grab me, and I can go out. It popped up on my screen. Okay. I never know exactly how that works. <laughs> Well, it's because I'm the host, I'm pretty sure it pops up okay. on my screen. So I know that you did it. And I'm like, okay, cool. <laughs> hmm. 
Yeah, I'll just have to go and check those broadcast settings. I think I set them up as you could do a voice broadcast, but I'm not sure on that. Yeah, I didn't see how to do that. I did see the, um, it just said send a message, which seemed to be a typed one. Okay. Well, and I can go and um, check off those boxes for oh, gotcha. both the audio. So that'll be something I'll I'll check after. I guess every webinar, I we seem to learn more <laughs> and more. That's fair. Well, and I felt bad that I didn't um, I didn't mention where they could get the roll tree in my mm -hmm. um, introduction and housekeeping because it was in the lobby and mm -hmm. usually that that Zoom window is still open and you can just click on it and download directly from there. So, um, duh, <laughs> I miss. I thought, why did I miss that? Well, I, I'm strike through. Okay, I'm getting <laughs> ready to hit close all rooms once my clock says 1113. Okay. Oh, there we go. I think folks are coming back in. I will adjust this so we can see closed captioning. All right, I think everyone is back in the main room um, because the rooms were closed. So welcome back. Uh, sorry, I know that is a short amount of time to try to, to think through some of these things, but uh, hopefully it, it at least um, gave you kind of a starting point to start thinking about your own story. Uh, and so I am I'm looking at the time we have about 15 minutes left in our in our time together. Uh, and we have two things left to do. Um, we're going to talk about, um, obviously, I want to discuss what you guys uh, talked about in your groups. Um, and I then I also want to move in the final um, part of the presentation to thinking about um, sharing your story. Where do you share it? How do you share it? Um, what um, what it might mean and, and sort of navigating like different spaces in the community to share it. So let's first, let's jump into the discussion. Uh, you are welcome to add comments in chat. Um, we can also unmute briefly to, to share out loud if you would like to. Um, sometimes chat may be a little less um, intimidating if that if if whatever but yeah so what were some of the roles uh that that were common within your group or were there any surprises in roles there were i i see kristen thank you for sharing there was similar strengths and some barriers too uh and and also nice to learn where people live yeah and be aware of the resources that are there uh natural supports yeah of course um uh religious communities can certainly be a it's sort of, it's a collection of um people within a space um natural supporters don't have to be individual peoples they peoples <laughs> they can be um smaller communities they can also be um uh, I didn't want to get overly complicated with this, but for some folks, the uh, public transportation may be a natural support or a barrier. Um, but thinking about those those community resources, community people, um, or collections of people uh, that might be a natural support. 
um, peers, um, being peers in a, a number of different situations, uh, definitely a common role um, within, within your group, since this is, this is a presentation and, and conference for uh, peer supporters. Other commonalities that you saw just in discussing um, discussing these things with your group members. Uh, were there common places that were important to folks? Another question to think about uh, is how might you use this activity um, to talk with the people that you support in thinking about what's important to them and how might you use even just this this um, this activity as a way to to better understand the different social roles that that are important to um, the people that that you're supporting. Yeah, gathering spaces, um, places where people can come together in a community. It might be work, it could be school, it could be, um, you know, coffee shops. But those places where people are able to to come together in a in a common, um, in a common area are always great. Yes, yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, certainly, people have. Um, there's the it's funny there's that spectrum of of uh introverts and extroverts and and it comes out in different roles in different times <laughs> yes it's often um that sounds like uh a story in and of itself uh your cat hiking and kai is your cat kayaking as well <laughs> and certainly city parks are great places for sharing stories um, and, and thinking about places where you can share stories, um, individually with someone else where it's, it's not a, um, it's not a threatening environment, you know, sitting at a desk where one person's on one side and one on the others, um, may not be a optimal environment for sharing a story, but, but, you know, over coffee or sitting on a park bench, um, or going for a walk together where you're, you're able to sort of see things around and talk without, you know, staring at each other, um, might be ways, uh, better places to share, um, stories. Casey, I'm, I'm glad you're, uh, mentioning libraries, they, um, my parents actually in Kansas, they, um, they work with a local library to host a monthly story slam. Um, it's out in the community, but it is sponsored by the library. So I think that that's um, a great example of a, an event or a place where, where community events can, people can come together and possibly share stories. So thank you everyone to, um, who, who took a moment to share their experience and thoughts from the discussion. Um, for those of you that, that didn't uh, share, that's no problem, um, but please use these, think about these questions um, and think about them over the next day or so and, and how these activities might inform uh, the acti the, the, your role as a peer and your development of your own stories. So then let's think about um, where do we share your story? Where, how do you share your community participation story that you've developed um, and why do you share it? So this is an opportunity to um, discuss those different roles with people and give examples of um, that, that we are all complex people uh, and we have different things that we engage in and different um, people that we interact with and different roles and identities that we express um, and that are important to us. So it's also, it's a way to share successes, challenges. It's a way to, um, you know, have a human moment where we get to share a funny story about something that happened or was unexpected. Um, it's also a way to, to help people maybe navigate new experiences by sharing our own vulnerabilities with navigating new experiences. It might be a way to also demonstrate how um, you've had to adapt in certain environments and, and change plans um, based on sort of the things that came up in, in your community and in your role. And it's also an opportunity to really deepen your connection with um, with 
anybody, but also in thinking about your role as a peer supporter, um, deepen those connections with the people you're working with and, and the peers that you support. So the next thing I want you to think about is connecting those stories um, and those peers, your story, peers stories to community participation. And this is an opportunity to an, explore and identify um, community participation goals or interests through storytelling. You get to learn about the things that are important to people um, through the stories that they tell. Um, and, and you get to uh, better understand those things that, that make a person who they are. And if in the storytelling, there's an opportunity to say, hey, that sounds like it's really important to you. Is that something that you would like to continue doing? Or are there, is there a way that I can help you in better engage in that activity or in that role? It's an opportunity to open that dialogue. Um, it's also a way to connect with, with um, community resources, whether it's community resources to share your story, um, to help develop your story, um, you know, there's uh, someone mentioned libraries earlier. Libraries can be a great place for um, coming together to have a workshop around storytelling. Uh, you can also use um, story tell uh, the development of stories as a way to navigate the mainstream um, community. Maybe it's meeting for workshop activities in common places. It could be libraries, coffee shops. Uh, if it's nice, meeting in the park um, to develop and, and share your story. Uh, it gives you opportunities to build connections and confidence uh, through story swaps or, or sharing those stories. And it gives everyone an opportunity to share their ideas and provide feedback. So, so this is an idea, um, story swaps are, are an idea where um, you're collectively working with people to develop and share their stories. And you share your story, it, maybe it's, it's not fully refined, but you're sharing it as an opportunity to get some feedback from other people uh, so that you can continue to shape it. Um, and then ultimately, if you want, um, you can you can take the role of planning some of these um, story slam uh, activities that focus on community participation. Throughout the pandemic, we hosted a number of virtual story slams where where people from across the country could come and share uh, stories related to community participation. Obviously, now that we are are you know through the 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 I will say the height of the pandemic um there's more opportunities to 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 host uh more in-person ones or connect with community based uh story slam opportunities which is a great way to to get and connect with the community and also share with other people um these other stories so let's talk a little bit about story slams um, because I do think that they are sort of a unique feature around um, what we've been talking about today. And there are typically three rules of story slams. Um, they are true to your life and experiences. Uh, the stories, tip, they relate to whatever that chosen theme is. And sometimes the relationship can be pretty tangential. They're often very open. Um, and uh, the story is typically no longer than five minutes. Um, in in story slams where they're out in the community, sometimes they will they'll give you they're like, okay, you have a minute. And once you get to the point, they may say, all right, you're done. Um, it's really it's it's meant to be lighthearted and not rude, um, but it's a it's a way to make sure that the stories keep moving and everyone has a chance to tell their story. Um, so that's kind of the things about story slam. Just some rules about story slams to keep in mind. Um, but what are they? It's a live storytelling event where people come together to share these um, chosen stories. It's not a life story. Um, it's a specific moment in time with a beginning, middle, and end. You can host your own within an agency. Um, you can host it within the community. Again, you can do live or virtual, or you can also look to support people to connect to some of these public story slam opportunities that might be out there. Uh, the reason that we're su suggesting story slams is that it's an opportunity to share stories uh, with a common theme. Um, and it's a, really a powerful way uh, to create opportunities to connect. 
And, you know, when I think about, um, there was a, a story slam that was hosted in, by, by the, the Temple Med School. And it was, it was a great example because it brought together everyone, anyone that had interacted within the medical community. So doctors shared stories, um, uh, people who worked in the janitorial services shared stories, um, nurses shared stories, people who had been patients within the hospital shared stories, med students shared stories. So there was, you know, it was open to everyone to come and share their story. And it was an opportunity to have this um, shared storytelling experience of the, and I think they called it health on North Broad, Broad Street is the, the street that our university is located on. And, and it was a great, honestly, leveling experience to hear the perspectives from different people. And um, it, it gave people an opportunity to connect around like interests. Um, and often this is related to what that, that theme is. It could be sports, being a parent, being creative. Um, it's a great way to, to get to know people and possibly make some of those friends. Uh, and then the case for Story Slams around sharing and listening to those stories. Um, it can increase your social network. It can increase your, your confidence to just engage with diverse people. Um, you have different exposure to different, um, different stories, different people, different backgrounds, which sort of can en enhance your worldview of, of the diversity of people that are around you. Um, and so I really think that there's an opportunity here, whether you're, whether you're engaging in community-based story slams or thinking of ways to host your own and bringing people together around these, um, around these activities, it's a way to really learn about the people that you're connected to um, in a way that you might not otherwise get to uh, because these stories are such a unique way of sharing who you are um, and learning about who other people are. So with that, um, thank you. Um, thank you so much for, for hanging with me today and, and um, thinking through your own story and thinking about um, taking the steps to think about community participation stories. Again, if there are ways that you are interested in um, doing this in your own um, practice as a peer, uh, please, uh, but you want, you know, you have questions or you want some support, please feel, re uh, feel free to reach out to me directly. Um, Mary, thank you for dropping my email in the chat. Um, there are a couple different links on there um, on the slide. You can email me directly. You can email our center more broadly. And then I also saw um, Mary dropped our, our website into the chat as well. Uh, if there's anything related to community participation that you would like to learn more about um, and you see something interesting on there, but, but want some support in implementing, please let me or um, our center know and we'd be happy to connect. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Gretchen. And I'm hoping that everybody is thinking about all of their community participation stories. Um, I wanted to give you a reminder, check your confirmation or reminder email for full CEU requirements. And you have 48 hours after you receive the, or um, 48 hours to complete the evaluation. And there is options to redo within that 48 hours. And you won't get an email with the link immediately. It usually takes a couple hours after we close the session. Um, you can direct questions to Empower Idaho staff. And I can drop that in the that email again in the chat. Let me do that. And um, and the recording will be available on the website in a few days, so you can refer back to it. Plus, um, we'll also have the slides available. Thank you for attending, all of you, and we look forward to seeing some of you later this afternoon. Thanks again, Gretchen, everybody. Have a great day. <laughs>